Um, patient came in and he was wearing a little plastic denture to replace his upper central incisor there. Okay, and uh, he wanted an implant. He'd had an implant placed, I think, which hadn't succeeded. So he wanted to get rid of the plate. That was very important to him. So what would you do? What would you do for this patient, Eldo? He wants to get rid of his um, denture. Move his denture. Actually, his denture looks very good. He doesn't like it. Okay. You go and place an implant after his video. Okay. So it's going to take this patient um, about a year uh, to a year and a half to get his gums really healthy. Will the patient generally agree to it? Taking okay. so much of time. Okay, now just uh, see what difference is between what you're suggesting, Eldo, and what I did. Okay. On that first visit, I cut off the denture tooth and glued the tooth in place. I etched the two teeth either side and with fluorable composite, I glued the tooth in place. I then took an impression and a technician made uh, three wires for me, orthodontic, uh, twist flex wires. I then, when he came in for the next visit, uh, glued the wires in place. So he had this uh, right from the time that I started treating him to the time that I'd put the implants in implant in and restored the implant. Do you ever get uh, twist flex uh, wires made in by an orthodontist, uh, orthodontic lab, Elder? Yes, we get it like that. Yeah, okay. Well, you know, uh, the twist flex, the, the wire is attached to an acrylic stent that goes on the occlusal surface. Do they do that for you? Well, you have them no. do three. We haven't asked. They, they could do it. I have never asked. We do it directly in the patient's mouth. What, you bend the wire? No, we get wires, you know, twisted wires ready-made. What, you send an impression or off to the you send a model, yes, I, yeah. the technician has a model and bends the wire. Or we can do it uh, in the patient directly, in the patient's mouth. That's going to take more time. Stuart's technique is like you make a, a kind of RPD and then uh, you take it from the model and then just fix it on the patient's mouth. Um, yeah. I'll try and find Please. the the uh, presentation that shows us this. Okay. Um, what time is it with you at the moment? Ten. Nine thirty-five. Nine thirty-five. Okay, we can still go, can we? Um, Tejas, have I not shown you uh, how you do these twist flex wires 
the, you have the technician make them for you? No, I haven't seen that. Oh, well, you know, you. What I do is I make them directly in the mouth. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, I was a general practitioner. I didn't spend my time bending wire. So it wasn't something I could do very easily. Um, I'll show you about that. It's so much easier to get a technician to make them. So you make them, they make uh, three wires with the uh, stent on top so that when you fit it in the mouth, the wires are right up against the back teeth, the back of the teeth, and then you uh, etch the surface and you glue them in place, and then you cut the stent thing off the top. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, we take a history, and these are the x-rays I took. Uh, Uh, find yourself a chart, okay, a patient chart, and we'll chart this, okay? Have you got one of my charts, uh, uh, Satish? Okay, so put a blue line down the upper right uh, third molar. Uh, you could also, a bit later on, draw in the bone level. You see there's no tooth decay there. Uh, Now, on the chart, in red, draw the, uh, the bone level. Okay. And then that's the... Uh, the lateral incisor, just continue the line going along. And then chart the missing tooth, the blue line down the center of that tooth. <coughs> Bone level's not bad here. Uh, look at the bone level on that um, second premolar. And put a red arrow pointing downwards, indicating that there's a buried uh, third molar there. Is your red arrow? Put a, you could put a red arrow, yes, a red arrow. I mean, it's, it's not a problem, really, on a 70-year-old man. <laughs> if, if he was going to have trouble from that tooth, he would have had it by now. Drawing the bone level there. Bone level is quite good along here. Now you could draw the bone level here. There is no um, bone around that distal root.
What are the possible treatments of this patient? Extraction of this tumor. And? Perio to attach proplaning of the rest of the tooth. And implants. Okay, removal of that tooth and an implant uh, is one. A hemisection. Uh, a hemisection. Yes. Uh, I have years ago, before I got into implants, uh, root canal treated the mesial root and cut off the distal root. Now. If I go into the local shop and I ask them for some, do you know caviar, Akshaya? Do you know what caviar is? No, sir. Oh, it's a very, very expensive um, fish eggs. Okay. It's um, uh, the sort of thing you get first class, uh, on a first class flight on Emirates. Okay, very expensive. Now, if I went into the local shop and asked them for some caviar, they wouldn't be able to sell it to me because they don't have it on the shelf. Okay. Now, uh, if you went into Tejas's clinic, with this condition, Tejas could offer you uh, the possibility of a root canal treatment to the mesial root and to cutting off the distal root. He could also offer either himself or somebody uh, to put an implant in. Okay. Now, uh, in future, somebody going to Eldo's practice hopefully would be offered those two different treatments. The preference, the, the preferable one is the implant route. But the patient might not want that. Okay. Um, so the third molar is missing. So put a line through the third molar. A blue line, okay. Sir, with the poor maintenance, can we go for implant placement, sir, for this case? Uh, say that again. Can we go for implant for this poor maintenance case, poor oral hygiene? At this stage, no. At this stage. Okay. Now, uh, you've seen all these x-rays. Uh, we'll see what I did for this patient. A friend of mine showed me a similar patient, a uh, panoramic x-ray. And I said, oh, what, what are you going to be doing with this patient? And he said, I've sent the patient to the hygienist and I'm putting implants in in, uh, in about three or four weeks time. I said to him, this would take me about a year to a year and a half before the patient was fit to have implants. But he's not interested in health. He just wants to put in as many implants as possible.
taking x-rays uh, of a front area like this. I don't believe you can see a very good image. Eldo, when you look at the upper central incisor area on your panoramic x-rays, uh, yeah. how good are they? Uh, it's quite difficult to identify the central incisor area, even the yeah. upper or the lower. Okay. So, uh, if you wanted to measure the height of that ridge, you put a Bowley gauge into the patient's nose and the other part of the Bowley gauge on the ridge. Have you ever done that, Eldo? No, I've not done that yet. Yeah. The next time you uh, anesthetize a patient uh, in the upper anterior region um, and you're placing implants up there, just do it and see what you think, okay? Okay, I'll do that. So, now I want you to look at this area here. Do you see any tooth decay? No? Okay, just remember that, okay? Um, Oh, there's a wisdom tooth up here. So put a red line down there instead of that, uh, that blue line, put a red line down, an arrow. So the first visit that I saw him, uh, uh, Satish, I did a bleeding index. I showed him toothpicking the video, and then I showed him toothpicking. He had been seen by somebody that I'd taught, who had shown him a little bit about oral hygiene. So his ring, original bleeding index was much more than this, okay? So I only started him after he'd started to clean his teeth a little bit better. So I taught him toothpicking using the Dr. Barman's toothpicks. Uh, on the next visit, about one to two weeks later, I checked his toothpicking. I showed him toothbrushing video and I showed him toothbrushing. And I showed him the best technique of toothbrushing, vibrating the toothbrush um, 10 times in each, uh, on each two teeth. So I normally have a toothbrush available to show you, but I don't at the moment. Um, okay, so it's a modified bass technique pointing downwards into the uh, sulcus. Gigi sulcus. Now, um, I have had in the past electric toothbrushes. Um, I think they're a gimmick. Um, I think a Standard toothbrush is just as good. And you need to scrub in and out like this. In and out 10 times on each six front teeth. If you get calculus behind your lower front teeth, or your patients do, it's because you're not, they're not doing this. Calculus is not inevitable. Okay. 
Eldo, are you brushing in and out like this? Always. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Now you can scrub here. Uh, you don't scrub here. If you scrub here, you're going to damage the gum. But scrubbing down here, the tissue on the inside there is so tough, you cannot cause any damage. So, uh, Satish, do you brush like this in your lower front teeth? Yes, sir. You do? Good. The rest of you who may not have come across this, just from today onwards, scrub in and out. Ah. Um, Satish. I'm going to show you how to yes. hold a toothbrush, okay? Do you see, I've got the brush just above my little finger. Oh, yeah, well done. How did you know that? Sir has shown, sir. Tell you I showed you. Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, do you do that, um, Harika? Uh, what is that? Can you just show me again? Yes. Do you see? I've got my uh, toothbrush above my little finger. Yeah, I can. Okay. Now, you see, when I'm cleaning, if I didn't do that, I'd be doing this. Which is much harder work. Waste of time. Better to do it with your little finger underneath. Okay. Okay. Now, and this is how you brush your lower front teeth. That's uh, 10 times on each tooth, each six front oh. teeth, okay? Okay. You shouldn't need, you should not. I like to have my teeth cleaned every 10 years or maybe 15 years. Okay, you should not need to have them clean. You clean properly. So this is more difficult and you scrub in and out the same way for the upper front teeth. Okay, um, so one to two months later, I did a gum check, uh, checked his toothpick in, uh, checked his brushing. Now, he did have pockets. I knew he had pockets. Uh, and I knew that I was gonna need to do some uh, skilled curatage for him. I then, this is after a month and a half, introduced him to interdental brushing. I taught him just the green brush to start with. Just one thing at a time. Next visit, toothpicking, toothbrushing, interdental brushing. And then I taught him the mauve and the gray brushes because he was only going to use these in about two or three places. <clears throat> so he needed the, the gray ones down here and up here. I then did a gum check, toothpicking, uh, toothbrushing checked, interdental brushing checked. Now at this stage he was cleaning really well but because he'd got pockets, I needed to do a stay on cur curatage for him. Um, on his chart, I put down where he used the different brushes. So it would remind me when I saw him the next time. So he's ready for a scale on curatage. So 
I'm going to do scale and curvature quadrant by quadrant. Uh, and I'm going to remove the lower left uh, first molar and place implants at some point. Now, Ramford in the States in the 1960s treated some patients with the curatage in one quadrant, one quarter of the mouth, gingivectomy in another, flap surgeries on the other quarters of the mouth. There was no significant difference in the results. So there's no point in raising flaps. All you need to do is to do very thorough scale and curatage. Have you done one of these yet, uh, Tejas? Done one of what? So have you flaps? Done, have you done a scale and curatage? Scale and curatage, yes. With no flap. No flap. It's been about three and a half, four years now since I did a flap. Good, 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 good. Eldo, have you done a scale and cure time? Periodontist is very sad. Absolutely. Good. So he should be. <laughs> they should all be um, um, eliminated from, uh, from the dental world. Eldo, have you done a scale and curatage yet? No. What do you do with your patients who've got deep pockets? Mm, all the same, I've been transferring them to a periodontist. I should, I should be. I, I've got the uh, just one case I tried, uh, but I don't know. I, I didn't follow it up. Yeah. You see, the problem with periodontists is that they know that you want the patient back again. So they're going to do all this surgery and stuff very quickly. And uh, it doesn't give the time for the patient to, uh, um, to get really motivated about looking after themselves. Uh, the, there was a study where they, they treated patients with intrabony defects uh, and they treated them with curatage only on one side and curatage and grafting on the other side. And guess what? There was no significant difference. except for the fact that on the side where they just did the scale and curatage, the industry did not make any money out of graft material. <laughs> um, so, I did a scale and curatage on the upper right quadrant Uh, Satish, um, are you you're practicing dentistry at the moment? Are you? Mm, at present, I'm not. Sir. Oh, yeah. I'm at home. Okay. You're back at home. Okay, right. Um, you only need two scalars. Okay, the, the Gracie 1718S and the Gracie 1314S. These are the only ones you need. Uh, I've bought all the different types of scalars. And when I go to people's clinics and I see this, all the different scalars they've got, I think what a waste of time. Okay, all that sterilizing and mucking around when you can do it perfectly well like this. 
now I'm not going to ask you, Eldo, if you sharpen your scalars after every use. But they should be sharpened. Yeah. So should your luxators after every use. And you need a sharpening stone, that cylinder, and you need emery paper. So I'm just going to show you about sharpening the Gracie 1718S. And then you take this uh, emery paper and just go over the edges because microscopically there's a whole lot of little sharp bits. Oh, just one second. So this is sharpening the uh, 1314. So what instrument is that? The sharpening. This, what is the... Uh, the cylinder. Say it again. The cylinder that you used, what is that? It's a sharpening stone. Sharpening stone. Um, you need this sharpening stone. It's just a standard sharpening stone, uh, um, Tejas. I have the rectangle or the cuboid. Yeah. I don't have yeah. the is it round? Uh, no, I don't. It's not round. It's like a cuboid. Whatever that is. <laughs> uh, a rectangle, a three-dimensional rectangle. Oh, no. No, it needs to be round. Uh, Google uh, dental sharpening stones and see what they come up with. OK, and then... Uh, This emery paper I got on uh, on uh, uh, Google, Amazon. So, uh, scale and curatage, you put in the local anesthetic, buccally and palatally. And then you curette out all the granulation tissue using the 1718S and you scrape around, scraping out all the granulation tissue. Uh, and then you take a scaler like this. This is a guy's hospital pattern scaler, uh, excavator. This is the only excavator you need. Um, if you buy a dozen of these and throw away all the rest of them, life is much, much more simple. So you take this and you curette out any more granulation tissue. <clears throat> 
all the way around, every single two in the bifurcations, wherever you can find granulation tissue. Then you use the ultrasonic scalar <coughs> around sub subgingivally all the way around the teeth. You then root plane with the 1718S. And you go up and down the tooth. And when you do this, going up and down, you hear a squeak. And as you progress after about 15 to 20 strokes, <clears throat> the sound, uh, the squeak goes. Have you experienced that, Elder? Yes. You, you've experienced the squeak up and down the root. That's an Eldo yes, which means no. <clears throat> okay. So you go all the surfaces of the tooth, going up and down, listening for that squeak. Okay. I can see why uh, some of you have not sharpened uh, scalars because you don't do root planing. Having done that around all the teeth, you then go to the 17, the 1314S and do the same thing. Listening for the squeak. So I've gone back again now and I'm curetting out any more granulation tissue and doing this root planing. And right at the end, I do some more curetting with the 1718S and also the scalar. And then I uh, use the ultrasonic scalar again. This would take about an hour and a quarter for an upper quadrant and about an hour and a half for the lower quadrant. The lower quadrant takes longer to anesthetize. Postoperatively, I explain to the patient that they may not be able to clean very well in this area. Uh, for about a week to two weeks. I then check them two weeks later when they've started to heal a bit and I get them back to cleaning that area. And I probably suggest a wider interdental brush because the spaces will be bigger. I then see them a month later to do a, uh, to check the scale and curatage. And then to do another gum check because I want the patient to appreciate how much better, you see there's no bleeding now on that upper right quadrant. This is gonna motivate him that it was worthwhile. Next visit, scale and curtage the upper left. And I took out the upper left uh, second premolar 
which was loose anyway. Post doctor Flea explained to him, may not be able to clean very well there for a week to 10 days. I then had him back again two weeks later, got him cleaning really well, and then I get him, get him to use the wider interdental brushes on the upper left. Uh, I then reevaluated a month later, did a gum check, and checked his cleaning. And then I did a scale and curatage on the lower left quadrant. Two weeks later, saw them, got him back to cleaning again, got him using wider interdental brushes. Month later, I checked the scale and curatage. I checked the gum. I did a gum check. <coughs> checked his cleaning. And then I did the scale and curatage lower right. Two weeks later, saw him again. One month later, <coughs> did another gum check. <coughs> so that now, um, <clears throat> so now Sati, she's ready for some implants. Okay. Uh, and this is um, <clears throat> probably about a year to year and a half later. Yes. Now, a patient like him, he was interested in getting himself really in the best dental shape. Okay. Some people aren't. But the principle is not to treat everybody as if they're not interested. Okay. So this was the record of um, where he was using each, each different type of incidental brush. So I then put an implant in, in the upper anterior region. It is inconvenient to have to take off that uh, denture tooth and then put it back in on again, but that's what you have to do. So there he's got the implant in place. I then checked the implant the next visit, did a gum check. He's at zero <coughs> bleeding at the moment. Next visit, I gave him an estimate for a sinus graft on the upper left. Um, checked his gums, checked his brushing, lower front teeth. He's now down. Pretty healthy, okay? So uh, I talked to him about this tooth here. I offered the patient the root canal treatment and of the mesial canals uh, or the remove and the removal of the root or an implant. He said he wanted a proper job doing fine. So I did the sinus graft on the upper left. where that, um, now I did a sinus graft, which was all the way along the sinus, not just above that premolar. Because we never know when or if any of those other teeth might be lost. So by doing the sinus graft all the way along, there's a chance that, um, Later on, if he needs another implant, there's the bone in the sinus ready. So he's still at zero. Uh, he's now ready. Nine months later, he's ready to have two implants put in. Two roots, two implants. And he had an implant in the premolar region.
Hi. Now, I took two bite wings. Look what I found. I hadn't taken regular bite wings. And even then, this patient at the age of 70 who hadn't had tooth decay for years, suddenly started getting tooth decay. So, he ended up like that. So I should have taken regular exercise. What's the plan? Pick you up at six. We're going to drop the duck for one. Oh, pick you up at six. if I have to, okay, cheers. Uh, I um, have to confess that um, my friend from uh, from uh, Shandigar, who runs our local shop, is taking me for a beer outside because we're not allowed inside pubs at the moment. So as much as you'd like me to carry on, Satish, I'm going to be finishing now. Okay. Erica, can we see you once again? Uh, I think uh, I can't. Oh. Make sure we can see you, okay? Next time. Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, TGS. Uh, and Sidi, how are All you right, both? Sure. You're okay. Uh, oh, Ashwin had his birthday yesterday, and he's he's ill today. <laughs> oh, nice. I think he had too much of his father's homemade wine. <laughs> how are you getting on, uh, Sidi? Are you talking to us, Sidi? Yeah, let me know about those uh, sharpening stones, um, Tejas. I will. Okie doke. <laughs> All right, enjoy your beer. Okie doke. Akshaya, nice to see you again, and you to uh, Make sure you brush your hair next, Anand. But scruffy. You need to look like uh, Sati. She's looking much more uh, uh, professional. We'll see you next week, Sati. Okay, cheers then. Bye, so. uh, Sir. Sati, Bye, can, I, can I say goodbye to your son? Okay, cheers then. Cheers.